Um, so I will be talking for the next uh, 30 minutes about assessment of necrotizing theocolitis by ultrasound, which is a new modality that we have introduced for the last three years, and we have been um, doing that as a consultative service. So I have nothing to disclose in this presentation. So I will be talking for the next 30 minutes, uh, focusing on the three main objectives. The specific ultrasound markers in necrotizing colitis, the pathophysiologic mechanisms of these markers. So how the, like these markers appear in the, ultras, uh, in the ultrasound and the relationship between pathophysiology or pathophysiologic changes of neck and the development of these markers. Ultrasound classification of enterocolitis, that's a new classification, which might become like a parallel to the basic classifications that we have been using for more than 40 years, but that's relying mainly on ultrasound, not x-ray, and we are in the process of publishing that. And they have some case scenarios for discussion. So we have, as uh, uh, like described by uh, Dr. Neo, many diseases, and all of them called neck, and all of them are different in the, um, uh, as initi initiation of the pathogenesis. So we have the immunology in initiated uh, progress, we have transfusion associated neck, uh, lymphocytosis associated neck, cow milk protein allergy, or protein, uh, food protein induced enterocolitis, and then I have the last one, which is common in term or, or infant exposed to ischemia. So all of them actually started by non-ischemic baseline, but all of them, they are associated in one thing. They end up by ischemic, ischemic picture or ischemic uh, bowel. So as we have watershed areas in the brain, we also have watershed areas in the intestine. We have some areas in, in, uh, in the intestine more sensi sen uh, sensitive to ischemia more than the others. Uh, so just to, to explain the watershed area concept, if we have um, area in the middle here, which is area number three. So the area number three are receiving blood supply partially from area number two and area number one, so terminal blood supply. So area number two are receiving good blood supply, number one are receiving good blood supply, area three receiving minimal blood supply from terminal arterioles between, uh, from uh, one and two. So in case of ischemia or shock, area number three will be the most susceptible area, that's the watershed area, more than area number one and two. That's happening in the brain, happening in the intestine, when you have uh, multiple um, uh, areas perfused by different arteries. So, Ileocecal area, one of the most susceptible area, and then we have the hepatic flexure, splenic flexure, and the terminal, or the lower part of the descending colon, that these are the most susceptible areas in, uh, to be affected by ischemia. We call it watershed areas of the intestine. But for sure, if you have significant ischemia, all of the intestine will be affected, including small intestine. What about X-ray? X-ray, we are relying on three main markers and full stop. So either pneumatosis, portal venous gas, and perforation, these are the specific markers. Anything else is unspecific, like dilated loops, whatever else. But actually, none of these markers are reflecting anything about ischemia. So none of the X-ray markers reflecting, giving us any idea about what's going on as ischemia, which is actually the end result as a pathophysiologic mechanism for all of the kinds of neck, if you call everything as neck. Ultrasound, we have 12, up to 12 markers that he can see, identify by ultrasound. Like some of them can be identified by two dimension and some of them can be identified by color, which is reflecting the perfusion uh, uh, and uh, or can be reliable for either hyperemia or ischemia, which is two different entities in development of neck. So from number one to number seven, you have free air mural uh, gas, which you can see very clearly not the same like X-ray, and I have case scenarios to make it the, like the idea very clear. Portal venous gas can be seen even very small um, and uh, very small uh, uh, gases in the uh, in the liver can be seen by the ultrasound, which can be easily missed by X-ray, and I also have case scenarios for that. Thin bowel, so the thin bowel or thick bowel, that's all, both of them can be reflecting ischemia. Thick bowel is early stages and can be thick in the areas with the, uh, normally thick bowel like jejuna and thin bowel can be uh, thinner than 0.11 centimeter, and the, the, thin, the, th uh, the thinnest part of the bowel is a colon. So we can estimate uh, 
or, or we can evaluate the, the jejunum, ileum, and the colon separately by thickness, and we can get an idea about the impact of ischemia and all of them. Peristalsis can be affected, which you cannot appreciate by, by X-ray for sure, because in ultrasound, there's a dynamic study, and the signature, and I will explain that in more details later. You can see complex fluid or proteinal fluid, which is also might be difficult to appreciate by X-ray. And then by color, you have three uh, markers. You can have here in this box, normal color. So you have two by two color box. You have speckles of color reflecting. You have good perfusion, and that's normal pattern. And you have here uh, Y-shaped, one of the common pattern of abnormal hyperemia. And you have circular pattern of um, uh, blood flow. That's also abnormal hyperemia or zebra pattern. So just remember these three patterns because I have case scenarios and uh, some of these scenarios presenting with the hyperemia of one of these patterns. If you cannot see color at all, that's a severe ischemia and the, representing that there is no any more blood flow going to the intestine. So if we divide uh, these markers, we, we can appreciate that. The first part is reflecting actually the bowel wall. The second part reflecting fluids, and the third part reflecting blood fizzles. So we have three main categories, and let us translate that into pathophysiology. We have what's called intestinal signature. If you magnify the intestinal loop, you can actually appreciate the layers of the loop. You can appreciate up to five layers. Can you imagine that up to five layers, you can see it very clearly if you have very good modality ultrasound, starting from mucosal interface, number one, number two, mucosa, and the most the uh, thickened one is the musculosa, which is number four, and is hypoechoic. Anything in ultrasound, is, if it is dark, means that it is receiving good blood. If it is echogenic, means receiving less blood. So the most part in the intestine receiving good blood is the musculosa. And if this part turns out to be echogenic, then it means that you have ischemic bowel. So that's one of the very reliable markers to evaluate the ischemia of the bowel. So if you have the five layers can be identified clearly, it means that you have very good perfused, well perfused intestine. If you have this appearance of the signature, then you have ischemic bowel, especially the musculosa, which is the area number four. And you have the, the, the same layers by, by uh, histology. So uh, pathogenesis of sonographic findings. So we describe the three main categories. Uh, the first category related to bowel wall, the second one related to fluids, the third one related to blood flow. So the same, we are trying to explain the pathogenesis of them. So main trick related to muscles, secretory related to fluids and vasoactive. And you know that with the, with the development of, uh, of neck, either immunogenic or um, phasogenic, you have release of phasoactive uh, uh, secretions. One of them is bradykinin. Bradykinin is causing, uh, causing significant muscle spasm. Uh, which is actually affecting pristalsis and causing thickening of the wall and sluggish of the pristalsis. Is it significant? Is it helpful? It is helpful because actually that's helping in the, uh, the process of regeneration, approximating the healthy parts together and helping the healing of the intestine and preventing the pristalsis during the stage of, uh, uh, of neck. And then we have in the secretory area, we have the vasoactive uh, intestinal peptides secreted and will uh, actually help more secretions in the intestine in the intraluminal secretion within the wall causing thickening of the wall, secretion outside the wall causing peritoneal fluid, actually helping neutralizing the toxins and helping in the healing as well. So we have also vasoactive in, in intestinal peptides helping as a vasoactive in vasodilatation and causing hyperemia. So that's, that's a reason why we can see hyperemia in ultrasound. And when we have a bradykinin, which is also phasodilator causing hyperemia, if we see all of these signs of hyperemia, thickened bowel, and some fluids, it is likely to recover. But if you have bowel which is really thin, relaxed, and there is no uh, peristalsis at all, that's a bad sign. It also can be caused by increased secretion of phasoactive intestinal peptides. Bradykinin can help in uh, inducing tumor necrosis factor, interior leukins, and all of these factors helping actually apoptosis and clearance of the necrotic areas and helping also uh, uh, healing uh, or approximation of the healthy part and apoptosis in between of the unhealthy parts. Endothelin. So endothelin one is a strong vasoconstrictor. So it is helpful to prevent blood to going to the necrotic part and shifting more blood to the healthy part. So endothelin is strong vasoconic structure working together with the other vasodilator, which is helping healing of the more healthy part, 
vasoconstrictor shifting more blood from unhealthy or necrotic part to prevent the blood from going to unnecessary uh, necrotic or uh, gangrenous part of the bowel. So that's explanation for pathogenesis compared to the ultrasound markers. Post neck healing and complications, and actually the proteinal fluids might be helpful in healing, but also it might cause significant adhesions and um, uh, narrowing twisting of the walls and can cause uh, later on obstruction. Uh, longitudinal and circular muscle spasm, as I mentioned before, there's two layers of muscles in the bowel. There's longitudinal layer and there's a circular layer, and both of them will spasm during the acute stage as the effect of bradykinin. So that's actually helping to approximate the healthy part altogether. So you have area here in the middle which is unhealthy or necrotic. So the spasm, which is long, uh, the longitudinal muscle part, approximating the healthy part for healing and also the circular part helping also the healing. But that might end in shor uh, short, uh, shortening in the bowel and narrowing and structure uh, later on. So it's help helping in healing, but actually, actually might actually cause later on a structure and complications. So ne regarding nematosis, there is two types of nematosis that you can appreciate by ultrasound. There's a localized area here, so that's a loop of uh, colon. You can appreciate here in this area the uh, intestinal signature, so you can identify the layers, including the muscular layer. Here's this area here, you have bubbly area with pneumatosis. So you have part of the wall is really still healthy and the part of the wall is still is, is started to be uh, like uh, affected by pneumatosis. This actually healed in just two days. Two days after we evaluated by ultrasound and this area disappeared. That's localized area of pneumatosis, recovery is likely. When you have peritoneal fluids around and absence of signature, so the wall here, you cannot appreciate the muscular layer anymore, you have significant nematosis around, this, this infant develops significant structure and significant um, uh, failure to initiate feeding after recovery from neck. Thickening and th th thinning of the wall. So we have thickening of the wall. We mentioned that between 0.26 to 0.11 centimeters, that's a range of normal. So you have 0.35, that's thickening of the part of the jejunum, that's early ischemia. And you have thinning here and you have fluids around. Inside the lumen, you have fluids around, and that's late ischemia. Thickening is reflecting early ischemia and uh, likely recovery. So we have grading of ischemia. That's not actually my grading that uh, has been reported by a group of other um, experts. So if you have uh, thickening with hyperemia, that's early stage. And you have thickening with uh, ischemia, that's a later stage, you have th uh, th start if you have thinning of the wall, very thin wall, and there is no blood flow, there is no color doubler, can be appreciated here. That's actually late, and the very late, that's almost dead bowel, when you have thickening and no blood flow at all. There is no color doubler can be appreciated. So that's a, a grading system that we are using to grade ischemia uh, on ultrasound. As, we, as like uh, Dr. Nayo mentioned before, that's uh, in, uh, we, we call all of these categories arthritic, but they are, they are different in mechanisms and they are different uh, diseases, but all of them will end up by the same end result, which is ischemia of the bowel. So we, these are the, the uh, diseases, or the categories that we are evaluating in our model of assessment by ultrasound, necrotizing trochoolysis, the typical one in premature infant, compromised oxygen delivery as a result of severe anemia, severe hypoxia, shock, HIE, or in cell obstruction, and I have I show you one of the cases, cell obstruction can be associated with uh, compromised blood flow, which is, might be difficult to evaluate by X-ray or uh, uh, even contrast studies, and obstruction with normal blood flow. You can differentiate between both by ultrasound. So I have case number one. That's uh, t like one of the uh, almost uh, typical case to uh, what uh, Dr. Nayo described, 26 weeker preterm, abdominal distension, cafe ground, and uh, mechanically ventilated, initially initiated ventilation because of frequent apneas was acceptable like as a CRB of seven, and unre like um, unremarkable CBC. And you have this X-ray. What you call, like you to read this infant as neck, this X-ray has been reported by one of the expert pediatric cardiologists as nematosis intestinalis. So you have infant who recently ventilated for apneas, and abdominal distension, cafe ground, aspirate, and we have this x-ray here. Would you treat him as neck? And you have report as nematosis from expert radiologist. So this ultrasound was done. So ultrasound is done exactly left upper quadrant, exactly the same area that 
uh, was seen by, like, as, or described by, as nematosis by X-ray. If I would like to select a study to teach the normal ultrasound, I will select this study. So this infant was started exactly the same day um, on feeding, and there is no any other complication. If you don't have ultrasound, might be you might be hesitant to do that. If you have report from radiologist uh, with pneumatosis intestinalis, especially you have infant ventilated, some abdominal distension, so non-specific markers. So you have normal color dobra, you have normal restalsis and normal echogenicity of the bowel. So that's typical normal intestine. So I just borrowed that terminology from Dr. Nayo, bobeptosis. So in this, actually, that's, uh, again, explaining the limitation of the Bell's classifications that we have been using for more than 40 years. So this infant was described uh, by X-ray and, the, and the clinical as a stage 2A by Bell's classification. By After applying ultrasound, he moved out of the classification, and we started feeding on him. We saved him from seven days, MPO, and antibiotics. So actually, antibiotics, as, as you know, we, like he might be inducing neck by like uh, giving him unnecessary antibiotics for seven days. Case number two, another different case. 31 weeks, post age 34 weeks. Basing volatile stools for three days. CRB less than one for three times. A stable clinical condition. This infant was stable in level two at one of the hospital. Feeding was continued for three days in spite of blood stool. So the thought from the team was could be protein milk allergy. So let's change the formula. Three x-rays reported as normal. Okay? And then what you can see here in the liver. Sorry. So you have, uh, I'll just show it to you again. So you have some bubbles moving up here. So that's portal venous gas. This kind of small uh, amount of portal venous gas cannot be appreciated, to be honest, by x ray. Now I'll show the x ray done at the same time. It did not show anything. So, and for the same infant, you have area here of the uh, small bowel with the nematosis. There is no blood flow. So half of the color doubler box here was perfusion, and the other half, there is no any blood flow, and you have area with pneumatosis. Uh, uh, so that's the x-ray here. So uh, like our, my colleague from radiology, necrotizing colitis was portal venous gas on abdominal ultrasound. So we did x-ray at the same time, and his report to that, there is nothing. This x-ray was normal. But like you, you can see by your eye, there's portal venous gas, and there is no any central line explaining the source of portal venous gas other than uh, pneumatosis, uh, like um, a neck process. So that's another limitation for relying on Bell's classification. So we moved him from outside, totally outside the classification into class 2B with presence of portal venous gas. Three x-rays reporting for the same infant in the morning, afternoon, on the second day, all of them was neck, and one of them, the last one, was portal venous gas. So that's uh, like three x-rays in a row. And this infant was actually fee uh, treated as routine milk allergy, who started feeding. And that's one of the examples for too many examples. And for three years now, we have 43, 44% of the X-rays reported as NIC. Ultrasound was normal, 44%. So if you look at the X-ray, this is almost uh, like flip, uh, flip of the coin. You have close to 50% uh, or less sensitivity. You have 31% of the X, uh, abdominal X-ray reported as non-specific when in some ultrasound reported as NIC. On the other hand, 33% there is nothing reported in the X-ray or just non-specific. And it was, uh, the neck was actually significant in some of these cases, and some of them were significant. We reported all of these cases to our colleagues in pediatric radiology. So we showed them the x-rays and the ultrasounds in multiple times and uh, multiple presentations. And now that's actually one of the reports that I, I believe that's very professional from Dr. Barton Bange, he's a section head of pediatric uh, radiology. So how he described actually in this case, that's one of the cases we started feeding in spite that he thought it could be pneumatosis. So he described not a pneumatosis, transleucinsis. So he started to use a different terminology which might be consistent with like uh, considering the uh, subjectivity of the x-rays and limitation of the x-rays. Hypertransleucinsis could be intramural gas. This would be confirmed by ultrasound. This would be best confirmed by point of care ultrasound. D different case scenarios. I'm just moving on on a complicated case. So we have preterm infants, IUGR, uh, sorry, initially volvulus and then develop neck. Two weeks later, 
he developed NEC after the first attack of Volvolus, after being operated as Volvolus. So that's typical severe neck. You can see why shaped everywhere. That's severe, severe hyperemia of the intestine. And severe echogenicity, there is no any signature. You can see it's complex peritoneal fluid. So everything that you can see in bad neck seen in this baby, that's nematosis side by side by unaffected bowel loop. That's sloughed mucosa of the colon. Here with the, uh, that's a colon. And you can see part of the wall is sloughed inside. So post neck complications. And then uh, failure of established feeding for four tiles over five weeks. Five weeks started feeding, failure. Feeding, failure continued in TBN for five weeks. But I thought could be, could be obstruction. So that's an upper GI study in this infant. Showed no obstruction. In five hours, the, everything passed down to the colon. Uh, apart from dilated loops, there is nothing. Another lower GI study after another failure of feeding reported as normal, there's nothing. So we are considering GI contrast study as a gold standard and should be respected as a gold standard still. But for any like modality, it should be a, a limitations that we have to keep in our mind. So that's ultrasound for this baby. What you can see here, two loops adherent together in the middle. And there's actually backward movement of the pristalsis. The pristalsis should be moving this direction, not backward. So that's bidirectional movement of the bowels that cannot be explained by anything else other than obstruction. And then you can see that's very dilated bowel, by the way. So that's almost two centimeters dilated. The bowel should not be exceeding the uh, lumen more than 0.5 centimeters. You have another almost a small contracted bowel here compared to the previous one. That's left lower quadrant area. You have very long loop here with the lumen almost 1.5 millimeter. 1.5 millimeter, that's long loop on the left side. So you have very, very dilated loops and very small contracted loops. And you have side by side, very dilated loop and very small. You can see here, very small loop with the lumen inside, not exceeding 1.5 or 2 millimeters. Just to go back to uh, physics to explain why this infant, in spite of basing the contrast down to the rectum, then he developed signs of, uh, of obstruction. Remember that he, the contrast is just a 10 ml of contrast. And this infant kept two days or three days MPO before the contrast. So that his intestine was empty. So the narrowing, the narrow part of the intestine was able to pass a small amount of contrast. But if you are give, uh, give, giving feeding or feeding, we are accumulating the intestine. And just remind you by physics, Boise law of resistance. If you have fizzle here, and you have uh, like 50% reduction of the size of the vessel, you have 16 times increase in the resistance, not double. Because remember the Boise law, the radius is to power four. So any change, any slight change in the diameter is significantly affecting the resistance. So remember, like as I described, the dilated loop was two centimeters and the constructed part of the intestine was 1.5 millimeter. You have almost 10 times. 10 times difference between the dilated loop. So 10 times mean 160 increase in resistance compared to the dilated and constructed loops. Well, is it sensitive to consider ultrasound uh, in assessment of obstruction? Utilization, that's one of the meta-analyses performed in adults. Unfortunately, we don't have pediatric literature because in adults they are using CT scan. So they convert ultrasound to the CT scan uh, and X-ray. So that's a, like the written is a discussion existing literature suggests, suggests that ultrasound is a valuable tool in the diagnosis of small bowel obstruction with sensitivity specificity comparable to CT scan. What's the X-ray sensitivity in the same study and the same actually analysis? 55% is like a flip of a coin to sometimes to rely on X-ray, but that's about the plain X-ray. Almost at, almost at the end of the presentation, uh, just I will show you based on the more than 80 cases for the last three years, we started to have a kind of uh, uh, classification to uh, replace the subjectivity of the ballistic classification, relying on ultrasound. And considering that there is a separate entry uh, that was described for, uh, for the first time by Dr. Joseph Nayo, food protein in induced uh, enterocolitis. And actually we have in our cases that we have collected for the last three years, almost the same result that uh, uh, uh,
described uh, in, uh, in the literature recently published by Dr. Nayo. So the first category, protein milk allergy. If you have normal or localized transient colonic pneumatosis intestinalis, you may find very localized area of pneumatosis intestinalis, and it actually it resolves in two to three days. You don't have to keep MPO, this infant, for a long time. And this infants may have high thrombocytosis, leukocytosis, eosinophilia, clinical, non-specific, apart from blood stool. You have, if you have a, a, a neck which kept the MPO for seven days and then started feeding successful without any complication, um, we evaluated the ultrasound for this for the for those infant, and we have, we found that one or more in the ultrasound finding might be enough to diagnose neck. So a pneumatosis intestinalis at the watershed areas, portal venous gas, one or more is enough with simple fluid or thickening, a hyperemia. There is no definite ischemia. Lab is variable, non-specific. Clinical is non-specific, it's almost the same like Bill's classification. And that's mild neck. We evaluated cases with the neck and cases with the recurrent neck develop another uh, attack of neck or failure to initiate feeding after seven days of MPO. And we evaluated the ultrasound finding for all of them. So we started from the outcome and evaluated what was a consistent ultrasound finding with these outcome, outcomes. So two or more of these findings, including brutal venous gas, complex peritoneal fluid, thickening of the bowel wall, batchy ischemia, sluggish peristalsis, two or more is enough to consider as moderate case of neck. And again, lab work could be lactic acidosis, could be high CRB, uh, cytopenia, uh, clinical, non-specific, almost the same like Bill's classification. We evaluated cases uh, re required surgical uh, interventions like uh, for perforation or obstruction or all cases who died uh, because of neck. And what was the ultrasound uh, finding for these cases? We found that three or more of these findings um, is enough to, to predict uh, this outcome. The pneumatosis intestinalis generalized not only to the watershed areas, Portal levinous gas, complex peritoneal fluid thinning of the wall with generalized ischemia, absent peristalsis, uh, and perforation. Three or more of these uh, findings. Lab work, again, non specific, but clinical, this infant should be very sick and should be very acidotic. So that's a severe kind of neck. So that's a classification that we are working now. It will, hopefully, it will be published uh, soon. Classification relying on the ultrasound with more specific uh, finding. Um, plus clinical, plus lab work. So we took out the uh, X-ray from the, uh, the classification and we relied uh, in the classification basically on the ultrasound. So to conclude for my presentation, assessment of intestinal performance by ultrasound is helpful particularly in atypical cases. Um, when the clinical impression does not match the X-ray. So, so if you have X-ray in a stable baby or if you have uh, like a kind of sick baby, reported with normal X-ray. But like anything else, there is a limitation that we have to consider in ultrasound is an operator dependent technique. Needs a lot of training. And there's a lot of artifacts that we may have to consider making actually a challenge to do ultrasound for uh, like in some cases, like presence of air in the abdomen. New classification of neck will be available in the literature, the one that I described in the previous slide, with a new diagnostic approach relying mainly on dynamic ultrasound. I have to acknowledge uh, my colleagues from uh, in the section of neonatology, including the neonatologists, um, uh, in-house staff, the nursing staff, uh, the pharmacists, the RTs, all of them are like wonderful, wonderful colleagues, my colleagues from pediatric uh, surgery and pediatric radiology. And the Insta ultrasound team, uh, Dibak and Reem, both of them were, uh, uh, they are with us today. And thank you very much for listening. We have time, I think, just to take one or two questions from the audience. If, yeah. you know, if anyone's having a thought about questions, we also are asking all okay, the so speakers okay, from sure. the morning to uh, stay for a panel discussion at the end. So once we've got all the pieces of the puzzle together, maybe the questions will be uh, coming front in, into our minds. So, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. I don't know if this is working or not. Anyway. Uh, so do you think we have enough control cases to know exactly what's normal and what's abnormal to decrease the number of false positive findings with ultrasound? Yeah, that's a very good question. 
So, like for the last uh, about 20 years, we have a, like uh, our experience here, which might, like you think might, might not be enough, but in the literature actually, there is uh, um, a lot of reported cases from experts from radiology about the standard, what's the standard for normal? So the 12 markers that I have described here, that's were very well established and when uh, uh, very well described by the team in, at Sick Kid Hospital. And there is uh, another expert, and uh, he's now moved to uh, Montreal, uh, Dr. Ricardo. He's described in two or three articles uh, like the gold standard of normal pattern of uh, in sound ultrasound that we have been using so far, and it's very successful. And for the last three years, as we described in our cases, 44% the, the cases, and you have referred like a lot of them, reported by X-ray as neck, and we started feeding, and you decided with me to start feeding with them. None of them decompensated after we started feeding. So all of them saved from being MPO for seven days. All of them saved from being on antibiotics for seven days. Seven, like will end up by maybe two more weeks of extra admissions because we are in shade feeding gradually and to establish a new feeding, you may need like extra time, not only the seven days. So like this is our experience. I think we, um, we have enough evidence from the previous literature from our experience for the cases that we have done for the last three years. Reem did a study which uh, was presented uh, last year in PAS. She evaluated, I think, maybe 30 cases twice weekly up to establishment of full feeding to see what's the normal pattern in premature infants, which is really consistent with what we have described now. Is that, no? Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was more concerned not so much on the sensitivity, but on the specificity. Yeah. How many cases of false positive abnormal um, ultrasound? We see, and we call we overcalling. Uh, yeah, it's bowel. the same, yeah. the same idea. So I, I described two numbers here. So 44 percent of the cases reported from X-ray as pneumatosis, uh, uh, like uh, the ultrasound is normal, and the, the same the same concern when you have un, uh, unconclusive or non-specific X-ray and the ultrasound was very sensitive to detect the neck. At the same idea. Like, I, I can't remember for a, any one of the 85 cases that we have done consultation for the last three years, anyone was like uh, reported as normal and the infant decompensated later on. So I, I think you consult like you have the neurologist. If you remember any case, that just <laughs> let me know. So none of them was actually shown like the, like the, like the, the two ways. Like the uh, ultrasound, remember the 12 markers, we are evaluating four, five different compartments. So it's very difficult to miss any area. And uh, with the dynamic study, if you have pneumatosis or you have, you may be missing pneumatosis, but peristalsis and the, the, the dynamic nature of the intestine will give me an idea. There is maybe a few cases that we, I have recommended to repeat the ultrasound as a second day. So that's another, like if we have really concern, we, the ultrasound can be repeated the same day, can be repeated the second day. If you have to consider the studies, like very reassuring, there is no any other, uh, there is no any uh, like indication to keep the baby MPO longer than that. I think maybe one of the cases that I have done with you, we just decided to repeat the ultrasound the second day with the three, three X-ray reported as pneumatosis. And the infant started feeding without any decompensation. I think this is going to be a hot area of discussion. Yeah. We're going to take this forward during the okay. panel discussion. But thank sure. you so very much, Thank Yasser. you very much. Thank you.